Hello, Internet. My name is Quinn, and this is Blondie Hacks. I'm back on the big steam engine project today, and we are going to make the piston and piston rod and various paraphernalia around this. What's cool about this is that this is the last piece of the primary motion work of the engine. So once this is done, at the end of this video, we're going to see this engine do some engine-y things. It's going to be great. Let's go. Let's start at the drawing board here. You may recall that on my cylinder casting, I actually came up short on the dimension here, and the piston is my chance to correct for that. So flipping back over to the piston here, you can see that the nominal dimension is 500 thou, but there's a 10 thou tolerance on that, as indicated by the two printed digits, ignoring my dyslexically compensating pencil zero there. So doing all the math at the low end of the cylinder tolerance and the high end of the piston tolerance, I determined that if I take 8 thou off both sides of the piston, then the whole engine will be back in spec. The kit came with this very nice piece of 12L14 free machining steel here for the piston. And here's my cylinder casting once again, and I'm just going to double check the measurements that I had on the drawing there just to make sure that I'm compensating correctly. And I also want to check the diameter of the cylinder. I want to make sure that the dimension of that is where I think it is after the honing that I did in the last video in this series. As I've said in the past, the important thing here is not so much the exact dimension of the piston, but the tolerances between the piston and the cylinder. The drawing will tell you the minimum acceptable gap between these parts, so that's what I'm aiming for on this piston. It's very easy to tweak the size of the piston to fit whatever your cylinder ended up at. This is why it's always a good idea to make the cylinder first and then the piston, because it's much easier to fit the piston to the cylinder than vice versa. I'll start by facing off the end, as is tradition. There's a lot of extra material here, I think, because the valve eccentric is also going to be coming out of this stock, so you don't get too carried away with cutting off excess here on the piston. I'll use the face of the work there to square up my tool post, and I'll start turning down the OD. Now I'm taking my time here because this dimension here is arguably one of the most critical ones on the engine. The piston to cylinder fit really dictates a lot about how well this engine is going to run and how efficient it will be. Now the nice thing about steam engines is that they are very forgiving. It's not like on an internal combustion engine where if every tolerance isn't perfect, the engine self-destructs almost immediately. On a steam engine, they will always, always run. It's just that the better fitting all the parts are, the more efficient they are. And steam engines fail gracefully, so if you have a few parts here and there that are sloppy or aren't quite right, the efficiency of the engine just degrades, and it doesn't make as much power as it could, but they always run. And that forgivingness is why they started the Industrial Revolution, because you can build an engine like this relatively poorly, and it'll still run long enough to make the next engine better. I'm getting close now, so I'm checking my dimensions. I'm also checking at both ends of the area here for taper. Even though it's such a short part, it's only half an inch thick, because it's such a close fit that I'm aiming for, I want exactly a one thou clearance if I can get it. A few tenths of taper, even in this short length, could make the difference between a nice fit and a not so nice one. I ended up at 1502 on the cylinders. I'm aiming for 1501 on this piston. So as you can see, I'm just a few tenths over that, very, very close. But I don't want to risk another cut here, so I'm going to bring it the rest of the way down with emery. This is 320 emery that I'm using. You don't need anything finer than that for steel. It polishes up really quite nicely with 320. And then I'll work the end a little bit more with a narrower strip because I had a couple of tenths of taper right at that end. Probably not enough to matter, but, you know, once you start fixating on those lines on the micrometer, it's hard to stop. And that looks really good. I'm dead nuts on 1501 now, so happy with that, and I can move on to the center bore here. It's important to do as much of the piston in one setup as possible, because that will ensure concentricity here. Start by center drilling, of course, and then I'll go through with the pilot drill for the reamer that's going to be used here. It's going to match a shoulder that we're going to make on the piston rod that will register the piston. In we go with the reamer. The next feature is pretty interesting. We need to create a large dish feature in the top of this piston. It's clearance for the nut that holds the piston on the piston rod. 
to get the depth accurate, I'm touching off with the boring bar on the face there. Then if you look in the back there, I'm setting an indicator on the carriage. And then I move the boring bar clear. And then I can measure the travel inward from the indicator there. I had the indicator zeroed on the surface. And I can measure down to the final depth where the boring bar will need to end up. And then I reset the indicator there at zero. Now, there's a small hole there to start with. And normally you would drill something out to make clearance for the boring bar. This is the smallest boring bar I have, but I don't want to drill that hole out because the final hole here is going to be very shallow. And so drilling a very shallow hole like that is a risky business. So instead, what I'm going to do is because of the angle of that insert there in the boring bar, I can sneak in there about 10 thousandths. And what I'm going to do is just open this up a little bit with a series of small cuts. And that's going to get me my clearance for the boring bar there. On the diameter, I'm stopping short on each pass of where I know the final diameter will be. And this just gives me the clearance that I need to get the boring bar in there. There's other ways you could do this. You could create a small counter bore with an end mill, for example, in the tail stock. But this is what I did this time, and it worked just fine. Then I can measure that diameter there to see where I'm at and how much further I need to go to get to the final diameter of the dish feature. Now, of course, I can start using the boring bar as intended. When doing anything besides standard boring like this with a boring bar, be mindful of the grind on the insert or the boring bar itself that you're using because they don't all cut equally well in all directions. So, for example, when feeding outward, the grind on this tool is such that I can only take light cuts. However, feeding inward, as you see here, I can take quite heavy cuts. And that's why I want to do most of the boring this way if I can. Importantly, I stopped a few thou short of the final depth there on each pass, and I've stopped a few thou short of the final diameter. Now I can come back in, and starting at the center there, I'm going to take a light facing cut outwards to finish up to the final dimension. And then when I get to the final diameter, which I'm reading from the cross light hand wheel, then I feed outward to finish that surface. I did get a little bit of chatter on the side surface there, and that's an example of what I meant by minding your feed directions with boring bars. The insert that this boring bar has on it, the grind is such that it really doesn't cut well pulling outwards from the stock like that, so that was not a good way to do my finishing passes on those two surfaces. Next up are the piston ring grooves. I happen to have a grooving tool here that's the exact width that I need for this, so I'm just touching off on the surface of the part there, zero my indicator, and then I move in the width of the grooving tool plus the distance to the first ring, which is specified in the drawing. And then I feed in very gently until the tool just touches off. And then I zero my cross light hand wheel right there, get some cutting oil on there and start feeding inward. Now this is a fairly ambitious grooving attempt here. I was getting some chatter there and I had to slow the lay of the way down here. This is a fairly large diameter and a fairly wide grooving tool. So I'm having to run the lathe very, very slowly here. This is about 30 RPM and well, these little DC lathes do not like running this slowly, so you can see it struggling a little bit to hold RPM here, but I am getting away with this. This is right at the limit of a grooving operation that this lathe can do. Any more than this, and I would really have to do it in two passes with a, something like a parting blade or a, a narrower tool. It took me a while to get the feeds and speed sorted out on this cup to finally get rid of all the chatter, but I did get there in the end. That should be my final depth there. That looks good. So I'll just check it with the piston ring material. This is Teflon strip that they expect you to make the rings out of. So we'll get to that at some point here. But that looks like a really good fit. Now I just translate over with the indicator that's still sitting on the carriage there to the start of the second piston ring. I narrowed the distance between the rings by 16 thou to compensate for my shortening of the piston. I decided it was better to leave more meat at the edges there. I didn't want to make those any thinner than the drawing. And the second ring went very, very well because I had the speeds and feeds all dialed in already, so I knew how to do it. And I got all the way there chatter-free, except for, of course, the last thousandth or something. So, of course, there's some chatter marks now in the bottom of that piston ring groove. But it'll be under a Teflon strip for its entire life, and I won't tell anyone if you don't. I used the edge of my file there to get in and break those sharp corners on the piston ring grooves, and I think we are good to go there. Now I can part this thing off. Start by lining up the edge of the parting blade there on the face of the part, and then I'll translate over a little more than necessary because we're going to be facing it down to final width, so this is just an approximate width here, and I will part it off. <laughs> 
Now, parting this should have been quite easy, but immediately it started to chatter and complain, and I could not figure out why. I have parted off 3 inch pieces of mild steel, no problem. I have parted off 1 inch chunks of tool steel, no problem. So an inch and a half of free cutting steel should be no problem. And this parting blade fought me every millimeter. I double checked the height, I rehoned the blade, tried every feed and speed, and I got it done in the end. Yahtzee! But boy, what a battle that was. I do eventually figure out why, so stay tuned. So now I got the forejaw on there with the copper soft jaws to protect the piston there. I'm going to set up to do the other side. I'll dial it in by putting a gauge pin in the nice reamed hole there in the center. That makes an easy job of that. And that dialed in very, very nicely. That's running very, very true there. I'll just spin up the lathe and do an eyeball check. That looks excellent, so very happy with that. Now, honestly, concentricity here on the back doesn't matter a whole lot. All we're going to be doing is facing and cutting a dish, and if that dish feature was a little bit out of true, you'd never know. As I was setting up to face the back, I noticed something weird about that surface. Let me put a straight edge on there. Look at that dish. That is why that parting blade was fighting me for every millimeter. That is very, very curved on the back of that. So what that means is that either my parting blade deflected a lot, or more likely the tool post wasn't perfectly square when I started the cut. And so I was pushing that poor decrepit parting blade crooked through the part the entire time. And that's why it was chattering and fighting me so hard. It's kind of amazing that worked at all, honestly, given the conditions. You can see from the facing how much of a curve there was on that. It's really quite shocking. Anyway, after getting that faced flat, I brought in my new secret weapon. This was a recent donation to the channel. It's a low profile micrometer. It lets you get in behind tight spaces like that where a regular micrometer won't fit and it allows me to measure the thickness of that part without having to pull it out of the chuck, measure it, and then put it back in and dial it in again between every cut. So huge time saver, that thing. That's a Starrett 220 micrometer, and the bottom anvil on it is actually swappable, so you can put in different shapes. Really a beautiful tool, so thank you to the viewer that sent me that. You know who you are. The dish on the back side of this was cut the same way as I showed before, but I did the finishing cuts a different way. I fed in on the ID, and then went over to the center and fed inside out on the back face there. And then when I reached the mating corner, I pulled out at an angle to avoid scratching up either surface. That way all of the finishing cuts were in a direction that suited the grind on this boring bar. So that worked much better. And the usual deburring, and this piston should be basically done. On to the piston rod now. The kit comes with this piece of brass round bar stock here for the purpose. It's not my favorite thing, and I'll tell you why here in a moment, but I'm going to start by facing off the end, as is tradition. And this end is going to fit into the piston, so what we do is we turn down a registration shoulder that matches that bore that we reamed through the center of the piston. So this needs to be reasonably precise. So that's a nice fit on there. Now the outer portion of that registration shoulder gets a thread on it for the nut that holds the piston in place. The main trick here is to make sure that we have as much of that registration shoulder inside the piston as possible, but you still have to have enough threads to get a clamping action here. So on my first attempt here, as you can see, if I slide the piston on and then put the nut in place, I tighten the nut all the way down and the piston does not actually get tight. So what's happening, of course, is the nut is bottoming out on the ends of the threads there and not actually clamping. So I had to go back in with the die and put a couple more threads on that. But I want to have as few threads on there as necessary to clamp the piston in place. That looks good. Just for fun, let's spin it up and see how concentrically it's running. And yeah, that looks excellent. Of course, the nut is weeble wobbling because nuts always do, but the uh, piston there doesn't even really look like it's spinning, which is a good sign of concentricity. All right, now I need to pull the piston rod out, flip it over, and we just need to put a thread on the other side for the crosshead. The dimension of the piston rod here is specified as the nominal OD of this stock, and that's what I don't like about what this kit has done here. If you're going to do that, I think you really need to supply precision ground stock for that. Like the previous PM Research engine that I built came with a really nice piece of ground stainless for the piston rod that was on nominal OD of the part. However, this is just regular old brass bar stock, so 
There's no guarantee that this thing is straight or round, nor does it have a particularly great surface finish on it, which is not great for sealing around the packing nut. But we'll deal with that a bit here in a minute. For now, what I want to do is test fit the parts here. So I've got the piston mounted on the rod, and now I'm going to see how it fits in the cylinder. This is the big moment of truth here. Now, it may seem like it doesn't fit at first, but don't panic, because when the fit is this close, the parts have to be extremely well aligned before they slide together, and that's how it should be. So a little bit of wiggling, and it slides in there, and it passes the drop test, which is what you want. You want a piston to fall to the bottom under its own weight. On to the gland packing nut for the piston rod now. The job of this little guy is to seal the piston rod from below because, of course, this is a double-acting engine, so both ends of the cylinder have to be gas-tight. Now, sealing a sliding shaft is a very difficult thing to do. Nowadays, we have fancy compound seals for doing this involving ribbed neoprene and metal springs and all sorts of layers. But for 100 years or so, gland packing is how that was done, typically with graphited yarn, although nowadays we use Teflon strips for this. But the way it works is simply that this nut wraps around the sliding shaft and you tighten it inwards around literally a blob of graphite yarn and it packs it in around the shaft and mostly seals it. It works better than it sounds and cars even use these all the way up to the Model A. The Ford Model A water pump seals with a gland packing nut so it's uh, still pretty recent technology. Now back to that piston rod. I want to try and improve the finish on it a little bit without removing too much material here. So I'm going at it with some 800 grit and some 1500 grit paper just to smooth out the surface, polish it a little bit. I want to at least give the gland packing a fighting chance of sealing that. And make sure that I've got a nice sliding fit there on both the cylinder head and the gland packing nut. Like all basic bar stock, there was definitely some variation in the diameter of it and the surface finish was nothing special. So Emery took care of both of those problems. To test fit all these parts I need to make some hardware here. Now of course the kit comes with a pile of filister head screws to bolt everything together but I really don't care for those so I'm gonna make some studs and nuts here. I've shown this in detail before I'm not gonna go over it again. I just use stainless steel threaded rod for the studs and I make some nuts out of stainless steel bar stock here. I made 12 studs and 12 nuts and now I can bolt everything together. All right, let's do some fit up here. The gland packing nut goes in the bottom of the inboard head. Inboard head goes on top of the crosshead bore there. And then I can set the cylinder on top and I've pre-installed all the studs there. The studs on top are too long. I'll have to shorten those later, but for now that will be good enough. And the outboard head goes on top. And that's looking good. All right, now let's fit the piston in there. So I got the nuts on the bottom there. And let's slide that down in there, get that lined up, and hopefully it will just slide right in there. Once again, it's a very close fit, so it has to be perfectly straight, but then once it's in there, then it slides easily. That's kind of what you're aiming for. Now I want to get the position of the piston correct in the cylinder. It needs to be centered through its range of travel. And so I start by tightening that nut, which actually spins the piston rod at this point to tighten it into the crosshead. And in the process, I loosened the gland packing nut there, so I'll fish that back up in there. And what I want to do is tighten it into the crosshead just the right amount so that at bottom dead center, the space below the piston is the same as the space above the piston at top dead center. So I do that by measuring the space at top dead center and then doing the math because I know how big all these parts are to figure out how much is in that hidden area that I can't see below the piston at bottom dead center. Once I have that correct piston position established, then I mark the depth on the piston rod and crosshead interface there, and that will help me on final assembly. And then on final assembly, there will be a jam nut there on top of the crosshead to hold everything in position. Well, there it is, all assembled, and it's working really, really well. I was hoping I could feel some air coming out of the valve body there, but now there's still too many open passages here on the engine, so we'll have to wait till we get this shuttle valve in there before we start moving some air, but so far that's looking really, really good. Very pleased with how this turned out. I'm not going to put the piston rings on it yet because this engine is going to have to come apart about 50 more times before it's done, and having the rings in there makes that really difficult. So this is where I'm going to stop on the piston for now. I hope you enjoyed watching me make this thing. Thank you very much for watching, and thank you so, so much to all of my patrons who make this possible. You guys humble me every, every week on this thing, and I can't thank you enough. So stay tuned for the rest of this project, and I will see you next time.